Jim Pugh with Shepard Mullen on the board and a resident of Luma. Patrick Castor with California Hospitals. Channing Henry with the Crawford Hotel, Secretary of the Board. Daniel Sabon with Jade Enterprise with the Vice President of the Board. Katie Kiefer with CD14, Downtown Field and Public Works Coordinator. Wallace Lock, South Park Bid, Director of Communications and Policy. Josh Brigger, South Park Bid, Director of Real Estate Planning. Andrea Morgan with Barcito, I'm also a resident. Lulu Waldemarium, I'm with the South Park Bid, I'm the Operations Manager. Sunil Lalbani, Commercial Property Manager. Carolyn Gardner, um, General Manager of 11 HOA. Maria Favorzetto, I'm General Manager for Sonder. Uh, Jason Istrin, uh, Head of Real Estate for Sonder, Los Angeles. Laura Wang, Resident at Luma and uh, Liaison for our Building HOA. Alex Duran, Regional Vice President, Street Plus. Uh, Dana Barbera, Director of Project Management and Development for Collier and Los Angeles. Angela de Los Santos, Southside, Columbus Outreach Coordinator. Uh, good morning, Lizette, Alyssa, and Lisa Tansy. And I'm Laura Sumter, Sales Manager and Events Manager of the Club. Victor Gonzalez, South Park Manager, Manager for the Team Team. Raul Lua, Program Safety Manager for South Park. Okay, so <clears throat> thanks everyone for being here. There's a sign-in sheet floating around, and if you haven't um, signed in, please do so. Um, we do have forums, so let's move on. Uh, sorry, are there any public comments? There are cards floating around. Oh, May, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? May Chen Sam, YWC. And? Oh, no, okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Hi. Should we go? Uh, you can come up here to the front of the room. opportunity within the growing alternative accommodation industry. 
So what our mission is, is to fill in a gap where we are making the best of what people like about their short-term rental world, such as the ability to be in various different locations, um, the ability to be in various different locations, the ability to stay in a larger you know, home, have a kitchen, a beautifully designed space, but marrying that with the best of a traditional, of a traditional hotel, such as brand identity, you know, high level and consistency of service. And so we call this the deconstructed hotel. We, um, at the end of the day, are a hotel, but with a twist. So I'll dive a little bit deeper into that. I'm having some The controls don't work, so just let me know when you're ready. Oh, okay. okay. Um, at uh, what we consider, you know, still an affordable rate. So 
a, a really large space, you know, your own you know, living room, kitchen, bedroom, beautifully designed, and then aesthetic that is um, consistent across our brands, but in each city kind of really maintains a, a little twist to reflect that city's culture. By numbers, we, I'll just kind of emphasize a few, we already manage more than uh, 2,500 rooms across, you know, globally, as I mentioned. Um, you know, working with over 450 partners, you know, in terms of our hotel operations, uh, our global occupancy is above 70%, ADRs all around, you know, $200. Um, I mentioned, you know, over $125 million in, uh, in fundraising. Um, we have over 250 employees combining salary and hourly headquarters in San Francisco, and again, a team within each city that we operate in. <coughs> we were originally founded in Canada, um, and then transitioned and brought our office to San Francisco. So we are present in 15, actually by now we're in our 18 countries, really launching cities um, very, very quickly this quarter, um, and looking to expand. Who is our guest? Really, there's no specific <coughs> box to put them in, but definitely, you know, early adopters of all ages. You know, friends coming to visit want a larger space. They want a kitchen. Uh, families who also want more than just one, but just one bedroom. Um, actually, also business travelers who don't necessarily want the kind of cookie cutter stay when they're staying for for a lengthier um, time. Um, but really, it's definitely somebody who is really looking to to engage with the city and kind of have those moments of discovery where you don't want to just necessarily stay in the central business district or the most touristy areas we're trying to bring though bring you know guests the options to stay in other great places within the city where they can live as locals while they're still staying in a hotel um, you know we we have several policies with our guests and with our staff to really make sure that our presence within the building is, is building upon <coughs> that property's kind of community and standards and not directly permit. So, you know, making sure we maintain a good neighbor policy and form really positive relationships with our, with our you know, real estate owners and landlords. Um, so from blacklisting guests, if they, you know, hold a party, have minimum two night stays to prevent people booking for just a party, for example. Um, how we, you'll see a little bit of how we use technology to kind of monitor what is what is going on there. Oh, okay. So, anyways, I'll run through this. Any, any ways we, we can respond? Efforts to, to think about the tools, technology, using technology to both enhance our guest experience while also helping our operations. So, if it you know nests thermostats that help them walk into an apartment that's already the exact temperature they want to, but helps us turn it off once they leave and cost, for example. <coughs> and now we want to leave it to Jason to explain what that means. Yeah. And how we work from a real estate perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, nice to meet everybody who I haven't met previously. Uh, so within Los Angeles and within our model globally, what we've been trying to do is meet with the city and figure out what's our place within the city, how can we work with the city in order to so we have an offense model that we want to offer. Uh, within Los Angeles, we've identified downtown as the area that we want to start in. Uh, a lot of that has to put to do with the fact that there's no traditional environmental fire for any of those rest of Alameda and bordered by the Rodriguez. So our first goal was essentially, okay, we have 10,000 units coming on the market in the next two years. We have a lot of investors that want us to our greater vacancy rates and people are dropping around apartments right now. So the way we'd like to offer ourselves as essentially um, kind of like a trust or a safety net for a lot of owners where we can come in and ask them to convert multiple levels of their multifamily building while they're still under construction into hotels. Aesthetically, it's the exact same thing as multifamily, but by doing so, they'll be following the hotel code. We're doing the PCFO, we're with no intention of taking any existing multifamily off the market. We're looking to essentially create every multifamily building as that would be mixed use for a multifamily hotel. So the way we like to grow is really thinking about the local economy. So when you're able to spread, for example, all the 25, 50 units across 20 hotels, you're able to encourage your guests to go to local, you know, 
restaurants, bars, and coffee shops versus the you know, bus underpasses downstairs. Uh, so we specifically have been looking at downtown. Our goal is to handle between 2,500 units per building and run the same as smaller size so we can spread across the city so that guests can stay exactly where they want and eat anything they want to. But So we come in, our usual lease terms for landlord is anywhere between three and five years, but our goal is to be there long term. So we try to offer ourselves as a vacancy, safety net, and rental term prices. Uh, when we look at buildings, we try to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the tenants. So we'll usually take, for example, the top of the floors, the bottom floors. Uh, if we're taking a large enough uh, buy out of the building, we usually would like to have our own elevator. And what that does is it segregates our tenants short-term tenants from the long-term guests, so there's really no interaction whatsoever. And as Mavda was mentioning regarding our guests and our speakers and you know, so we're doing, I think one of the biggest things that we're working on right now is the ability to have noise detection in every one of our units, but not the speakers inside, which means that if any time a noise detection goes off, we actually have the ability to cut the music and turn down the music in that unit, like uh, but remotely. So it allows us to create the atmosphere that we want Parties are bad for the other long-term tenants, they're also bad for us, so <coughs> we work with them every single day. Yeah, when you look at your average multifamily building, you're looking at 25% lease up uh, pretty you know, before they go live with us. We're able to take or increase that and we are able to increase the income of the units that take up that building. We're a triple-A tenant, all of our units are insured by Woods of London for the triple quality per unit. So we like to look at ourselves as we're the corporate version of the multifamily tenant in a hotel space. Um, yeah, one of the other ways that we're looking to grow is, and from what we've heard from a lot of landlords, is there's a lot of office product that's sitting vacant up and down Broadway, all over the place, but landlords who have been told they, in order to lease this out, they first gonna have to do all the renovations Why am I going to invest in my entire building right now when I don't know if I can even lease it? So how we can change that is we can come into buildings and say, hey, if you built this out for us as a hotel, we'll pre-lease the entire place. You don't have to worry about vacancy. We will work, we will take it instead of playing a guessing game as we love to drive another million pieces of space and have to make the landlord do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here are a few buildings that we've done. Uh, the next few slides are some buildings we've done all over the country. Uh, we range in size from what we've done anywhere from 10 to 170 units. Uh, we do have developments in multiple cities right now that are hotel use, or where landlords are building ground up product for us. Uh, it's essentially a hotel use, but the build out is multifamily. And we have those going up currently in Vancouver, Austin, and Milan, New York, and Berlin. <coughs> Concept. I think the challenge in Los Angeles is how do you have the um, exit strategy if you're going to say it's a three to five year lease and you're going to convert back to multifamily residential. Can you explain what progress, if any, you've made with the city and being able to say, here's how we come in with your model to operate a hotel within a multifamily residential, but then also when you want to convert back out? Um, the, the hotel space and it's all multifamily. Have you got a clear answer yet from the city on how that's enabled through the zoning and permitting? So within downtown, we're actually looking at buildings we're coming into are meant to be 100% multifamily. It just so happens that they meet the hotel criteria in order to be converted to a hotel. So the conversion <coughs> back, they're, they met all the requirements when they first built it essentially, so it should be grand built in and we can convert each unit back. We're not asking for outside of Los Angeles or downtown where we would require less parking requirements and whatnot, then you would probably see more of a backlash because you built a hotel and you're not converting multi-family. Does that 
Yeah, it did. I know there's several brands trying to do the same thing, and it's smart to bring an additional hotel, but I think all the brands are having a similar challenge, which is how do you accomplish it from a zoning and permitting standpoint? And, and I haven't seen one actually um, come up with a solution yet. So uh, it, it's good to keep trying. I think it's the kind of cutting edge of, of what that market is. Um, and we'll be interested to kind of watch it mature in the city hopefully see it succeed. And then from the, you know, from working with the landlord and the potential of the union, we also talk about it. We would never, if we lease 50 units, we would never just make it into the city like London. Um, we just make sure that it's a be gradual with that equity and so here. And then we'll, we'll be able to see. Okay, thank you guys so much. This is great. It was great. It love the place.
Um, so what happens is we get events that are either unable uh, or unwilling to book or rebook because of the challenges that the convention center has. And then there's various rankings, so LA is not sort of at the top of that as it relates to um, convention centers <coughs> across the United States and our competitiveness. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ted and he's gonna sort of walk you through the entire process. Thank you, good morning. Uh, so this basically allows us to take LA Live, Staples Center, and Convention Center to the whole other level. Um, in our opinion, we've always seen this as about a 100 acre campus, uh, but today it doesn't work as uh, well as it could. So this is that opportunity to make sure it's uh, the political stars seem to be lining up. I think we now have the first time since that's a significant tool of this project. We'll talk about that later at the end. But basically, this takes the Convention Center to over 1.2 million square feet. Uh, we're adding about uh, 320,000 square feet of exhibition, meeting, and flex space, which can serve as either exhibition meetings or uh, for banqueting. Uh, this essentially gives us that contiguous space that LA has lacked for so long. And that, that's the, the main reason LA has not been able to attract some of the more lucrative uh, convention and meeting business, uh, because of the old ball, the new ball, they're disaggregated, and no one wants to have to make it all together and give us a very uh, competitive convention center with, and basically we, we compete with Anaheim, San Diego, and San Francisco, all of which are expanding their centers and uh, modernizing their facilities. Uh, we also are able to take the Lindsay Plaza. This has been a subject of much um, interaction with South Park in the bid here. I uh, wanted to preserve that as community uh, accessible open space. Um, Earlier plans you may have seen had a big ballroom sitting in the center of the Lindsay Plaza. We, uh, we did not think that was the best use of that property. There were other options to place the ballroom on city property. So the plan we're developing is to maintain the Lindsay Plaza as an open area. It would also provide space for uh, Staples Center events, for LA Live events, as well as for Convention Center events. It allows the Convention Center basically to have a public space take some of their activities like E3, anime, other show, and put that out to the public and take part of the events. And it really gives the convention center something that many other centers don't have. Uh, so this gives us that opportunity to compete at that higher level, win some of that business back that these other centers in California are taking away from us, and deliver what we believe can be a very, very compelling package for attracting uh, this business. And we also have said the city would like to use our existing entitlements. Fought long and hard, almost four years to work on, and he knows this very well. Uh, the Farmers Field uh, project, uh, which was about the NFL downtown. But with that, we gained a full EIR, which included you know, some very similar features to what we're proposing today, which is a new infill hall, parking garages, the redevelopment of the Lindsay Plaza into open space. We want to be able to use those entitlements to continue to basically cut about a year to a year and a half out of the process to seek a review of all of the um, public process. And the goal here is to deliver this project by the end of 2021. It's very aggressive, that's about three and a half years from now. Um, but we think it's very doable when we take some of those steps. Okay. So as, as Martha said, this is really two projects that we're advancing in parallel paths. Um, hotel expansion, which we had previously talked about on the north side of Olympic, has now moved south behind uh, Microsoft Theater. So that's Microsoft, this is the existing 16 sorry, 54 story tower. We're proposing a 40 story addition connected to existing hotels. So the existing drop off of the uh, JW lot of Olympic would serve this hotel as well, although large groups coming by bus, vans, etc., could have drop off in the river. This would be about 40 stories, 850 keys, and we would have would basically double the amount of uh, convention uh, support space, uh, meeting space exhibition and uh, uh, a big ball we have about 51,000 square foot ball as part of so we have in, in the aggregate about 109,000 square feet of space. So uh, this gives us a real competitive package for not only supporting the convention center with a big room block, but also being able to accommodate a large uh, self-contained business. So this is just a diagram of the various pieces. This is Staples, Microsoft Theater, LA Live, and the Casa. Hotels up here. Uh, there's a 
bridge across Georgia that connects to the three volumes we have today, 17, 22, and 26,000 square feet. So this is now the segment we're proposing to develop with the hotel tower, the big ballrooms, seating spaces, and then a connected bridge to the West Hall. So it really is, in our view, probably a better solution than having what we have proposed before, which is meeting in the banquet space here and the hotel tower on the north side of the hall. It really brings that hotel package and the convention center much closer together. So this is just a, a quick overview of the hotel, about 55 meeting rooms, uh, totaling about uh, 56,000 square feet. Next slide. On top of that, we have a ballroom, about 51,000 square feet. Uh, with this bridge connector that we talked about, the hotel tower is over here. Next. Um, again, the tower uh, facing west uh, with spectacular views. We're looking at developing a rooftop bar and uh, amenity deck uh, that will have spectacular views to the west and to the north. And that's the hotel. So now moving on to the convention center component, we're proposing a phase three development program. This is a public private partnership. We have partnered with a group uh, that is very familiar with uh, that framework and format called the Plenary Group. Uh, they've been responsible for the uh, P3 development and delivery of the, uh, the Long Beach Civic Center project. They've also recently won a large expansion project for Cal State that said redeveloping that campus. And under this model, basically, it's the, sh it's the shifting of development responsibilities to the private sector. So the city would not be developing, um, but since they typically do in a bond finance mechanism, it would allow us and plenary to develop the development risk, the schedule risk, the operating risk, uh, which is a big deal, uh, because at the end of 30 years, we would be required to hand back these facilities in class A operating condition, which is typically not the way the public sector um, maintains and operates buildings. So the benefits of this model are it's a collaborative process, so we get all the programming input from the city, what do you need in terms of not only the existing facility, how do we upgrade those halls so we can end up with one facility that feels like it's contiguous to a totally competitive facility. Uh, as I said, transfer all of the risk to the private sector. We think that would reduce costs, reduce schedule, would guarantee the performance. And most importantly, it preserves city debt capacity for a lot of other things the city wants to do, including the redevelopment of the Civic Center. There's been some recent uh, discussion about the, the demolition and redevelopment of the Proctor Center site. And this gives the city uh, enormous uh, flexibility in terms of responding that does not uh, occur in the past phase. So we'll, we'll improve the functionality of the existing halls, new exhibition spaces, which is a really big deal. We then add a flexible space on top, which I'll show you in a moment, to reinvent and reactivate Killington Plaza, enhance this integration to create this integrated campus, which we think is, is, is critically important to not only maintaining and keeping the business we have, but attracting new business. And of course, it's a very, very big role in what the decision plan to make. And we will address the long term of this cycle. Uh, this is just a quick sketch of Closing. This is the West Hall, Compost Hall, South Hall. Those are about 870,000 square feet today. We'll add a new 190,000 or so exhibit hall that connects the two at the same level. There'll be a slight adjustment of elevation there that we do not think would be uh, problematic. We're hoping not to make it feel contiguous. Next, please. Above that, we'll develop somewhere between 25 and 35,000 square feet of meeting rooms. Connect a lot of the meeting rooms that exist in Compost Hall, West Hall, and then uh, they strip along the existing portion of the South Hall, so that brings the meeting rooms together as well. And then last, and then above that would be this flex space, about 95,000 square feet of fully divisible uh, large space that will have the ability to service as one big room for exhibition expansion if needed, uh, can be half and half or it could actually be developed into a, uh, a large banquet hall if and when needed. If our ballrooms are all filled, that could serve as a, a terrific banquet hall. So a tremendous <laughs> view. So now you're over the rooftops of the existing halls, having great views to the west. Next. So 
Lindsay Plaza. So again, going back to where we were uh, years ago, the idea was to take all of this pervious cover out the roads of bus loading, this paved plaza for the most part, the dying palm trees that walk to move. We would create garden spaces, landscaped areas, a large open space, maybe some community functions, possibly some retail uh, that help activate that space. And the idea is to make this green and uh, inviting and flexible. just a, a, a rendering of what it could look like, whether it's a farmer's market, kiosk, or in a visitor. Uh, you can see our, our sheet of ice happening here in the, uh, the wintertime for the holiday celebration. The idea is that this would be a very inviting and active space, but very flexible. This is a composite that shows all of it together, the hotel tower, connecting bridge, all the pieces that we talked about with the convention center, the Lindsay Plaza, the last piece is a expanded and upgraded uh, LA Live Lake Garage with take from about 850 stalls, close to 3,000, so we're pushing all that parking back toward the west. And that will serve as not only the convention center needs long term, but will help replace some of the parking losses that we'll really have experienced from developing the deck on top of uh, the west garage. And while we're seeing certainly shifts in, in parking demands, uh, with all the development that's happening downtown, we feel like we can really provide some community parking to make the center uh, function well and uh, support its long term growth. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, happy to answer any questions on that. Oh, yeah, I was going to talk about the delivery back. So we're proposing to get an MOU on a hotel and an exclusive negotiating agreement with the city done in the next. by the end of the year have both of these agreements fully negotiated so that we know what the, uh, the incentive package might look like on the hotel, which is similar to what we got in the first phase of what we did under the next. It's what Iceland received, so it's a similar kind of uh, TOT subvention or reinvestment of the debt tax. Um, we would also get a, um, uh, an ENA, an exclusive negotiating agreement with the city to pursue the P3 on the convention center, uh, which we think again is the best way to go. We're looking at probably uh, 710 million for the hotel and about, uh, about 500 to 550 million for the international service. So this is, a, this is a very big step forward uh, for us in the city. Uh, and then this is kind of what the, the, the end result is. So the fully integrated campus and all the things we're also going to be talking about is the closure of Chikern between Figueroa and Georgia to make this completely seamless of all of the space around Staples Center to Lindsay, all closed together as a, um, a very welcoming pedestrian or uh, public realm. And just one more note, last week, um, the city council approved sort of the initial steps uh, to move this project along, essentially designating the chief legislative analyst and a variety of other departments to participate in the review of our proposal and the other options. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think the possibility would be of not really having a, a new EIR? I appreciate this part of both, both of these are taking, so we have an existing EIR for the hotel. So that would, the hotel would fall under the LA Sports and Entertainment District's specific plans. So all of those entitlements we have does involve shifting it over. We have some height. The impact on the actual activity in the convention center right now. During construction, is that what you're Yeah, well, we're, we will be required to keep two balls in operation out of the building. That's a big thing. Oh, okay. We're going to have to have Australian and San Francisco to see what they're, how they've done that as they're adding and expanding their center. It's doable, it will be challenging, but uh, we think the fact that we have two balls today that are connected to the concourse hall really leave us with a pretty good opportunity to infill. Just for the graduation of the university, 
the aggressive timeline. His design looks far better, more integrated than the ones that I've seen from DC anyway. And you talk about closing off uh, to current court, which is great because I can see the integration there. In your design, do you deal with maybe doing scramble crosswalks across state or anything to further integrate the neighborhood into yeah, the campus? That's a great question. And there's a lot being done, as you know, on 11th Street to improve that pedestrian aspect and state trail and really will do that for the east west pedestrian corridor. But having said that, um, you know, the, the, you know, the city has, has done, you know, I think, a, a few good things um, with, with, with the Mike Pig Corridor improvements in terms of, in terms of reducing the, the width of Bigelow, which is important, and getting a bike lane over the street trail, which I'm um, But I think we're going to be left with probably the, you know, the, the wider crosswalks, the pretty foot instead of the one crosswalk. You see what they've done on the, the Mike Pig right. The international striping instead of the, the stamping, the, the, the much wider crosswalk, which is safer for pedestrians. There will also be a, a mid-block crossing somewhere down here. It won't be middle exactly, but somewhere down here will be a, a crossing between the Ocean Line Project and the other line, so that will help make that more permeable. Um, but you know, I think wider crosswalks are probably all we need. I think the scrambling is going to create some issues on the city. So uh, Daniel's comment as well, congratulations on getting this far. Um, it's been a long time coming for you guys, and I can say um, it's it's great timing now, particularly with all the big events coming, um, some of the other hotel developments, and just general community improvement in the area. So um, the political and kind of construction momentum, I hope you can keep that you know, going forward um, a, a lot from the PIDS perspective was riding on the expansion, right? Um, and so I think stakeholders in the community are really looking forward to the expansion happening. And uh, to the extent we can stay involved uh, and help keep that momentum, uh, I think the board would probably agree. It's, it's a good thing for us to track and help keep momentum, but um, congratulations on getting this far and breaking the log jam. Well, like I said, uh, I'm committed to work closely with uh, it hasn't been designed yet, but I'm 
concepts uh, in the popular scheme which has uh, you know, all the Florio on it, the Vince, uh, that's a lot of things involved in sort of bringing back out the Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, last question and then I think we're going to talk Because parking is an issue in South Park, and so I, I apologize if you already covered this, but how many, are you uh, adding to the existing sp uh, parking spot that will be available on the campus? Yes. So we have about 3,500 now. The convention center has about 5,400. So the goal is to maintain that balance and possibly increase it by about 1,000 with the expansion of the uh, only library garage. So we'll take 850 stalls out of this garage, which is called the 30th Street Garage today. We'll add about uh, 2,000 or 2,100 stalls. Um, but we will be losing about 800 stalls as part of the redevelopment. So what's the net gain then on parking? It's about a thousand, roughly. That doesn't seem like that much, but just <laughs> as a resident, it's just an issue down here. Anybody that lives down here knows, especially when there's multiple events going on. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of impact of uh, having shared use of hotels or not having anywhere near the parking demand that we've had in the past. And we're not providing much parking for the, the hotel rooms, the function spaces, and the meeting spaces at the convention center do require parking for the demand. We're not designing the parking for Easter Sunday, but uh, we do want to make sure we have, we have enough to, to attract and support the demand. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so Ted appreciative. Mark, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we'll, of course, be in touch about how we can contribute to the plaza plan. joining us, but um, he's not here yet, and so we can um, move ahead in the agenda, and then we'll, we'll take a pause when he, when he joins us. Um, so let's uh, review our financial reports. I'm going to kick it over to our treasurer, Mr. Bob Fente. Hello. Um, as I said, probably in every meeting, the important, the, the revenue side of our operating statement is pretty fixed. How much money we're going to get, we you know when we're going to get it. And the real issue is uh, managing the expenses. So if you look at the, uh, the May income statement, you'll see right now that we are year to date 6.1% below uh, our expense level. And that is, uh, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. As long as we can keep that going, we're 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 in very good shape. Um, that's it. Thanks, Bob. Sure. Short and sweet. <laughs> that's Bob Scott. We're gonna get into our committee report, so I'm going to ask uh, Josh Krieger to give us some updates with regard to infrastructure and planning. So, uh, upcoming openings. Um, for retail first draft, um, which is on the corner of Rico and Olive and uh, Duke's Dog Daycare. Both should be opening end of July, um, so that's exciting. That Pico Corridor um, is getting a lot of new retail. Um, new leases signed. Robex is actually um, coming in right next to um, dry cleaners on Pico uh, by Grand and Pico. Um, 1050 has all their um, Retail sign. So it's a small dentist office um, that's going in. You may have seen the build out happening there um, on the grand side. Uh, Chase Bank is going to be in the corner space. And then there's going to be a real estate office uh, in a small space um, on the east um, side uh, along 11. Um, new leases signed. Um, um, also, just want to say that Oceanwide, I've uh, been talking to the brokers uh, with Oceanwide, that's gotten uh, a lot more momentum um, in terms of retail um, attraction. Recently, they've got six restaurants signed so far, um, a good mix of, of different types of, of food. Um, a little bit less on um, you know, other types of, of stores, um, but they've still got uh, at least a year before openings. So they've got uh, some time there. 
uh, really quickly, long-term transit. Um, got some good progress on that, particularly the undergrounding of FIFA Station um, and the, the tracks to the south. Um, so there's been some um, turnover in, in, in Metro staff, um, some of the Metro engineering staff that is working on this. Um, we've had a couple of really good meetings um, with the staff recently, really open to sharing data. We share a lot of our, our data um, on new development with them. Um, they actually, so they're in the midst of doing this feasibility study looking at different options. They have basically taken a fresh look at it based on our data um, and sort of ran it up the chain all the way to the CEO um, and have gotten buy in to really do a, a holistic look at it um, from the executive level. So they're, for the next six months now, they're having their engineering team um, basically look at options, including full undergrounding. They didn't put any budget limit on it. Um, we talked about the EIFD that we're working on. They're very excited about that. Um, and at the staff level, I could say, at the engineering level, they're really on board with trying to get that underground. Um, and so it's a lot more um, sort of proactiveness from the staff level than we've gotten previously. So um, I feel a lot of, of good momentum with that. We've got about six months until they come back with those options to the Metro board. Um, and then they've committed to work with the bid um, and share information with us, um, kind of give, give us a heads up on where things are. Um, that's kind of an update on that. Uh, NACDO, so the National Association of um, Transit Organizations um, is coming to LA in September, September October. October. Um, and so as part of that, they're doing a number of different what they call workshops, um, one of them which will be in South Park. Basically like a walking tour um, where we talk about a lot of the transit projects that um, we've done in the neighborhood. Um, so we're working right now um, with that team in, in setting up that tour. We are looking for stakeholders who um, can sort of participate um, in that tour around South Park. Um, we've got stops around Figueroa, Convention Center, LA Live, Pico Station, um, 11th Street, basically all the sort of hot spots in the neighborhood. Um, so if there's anybody who is interested in, in participating, um, you know, taking a few minutes during those um, tours to kind of talk to the group about um, transit things that are happening in the neighborhood and how that's affecting your business or you as a resident, um, feel free to, to reach out to us. We'll probably be reaching out on some of you. Any questions? Yes. What happened with the West Santa Ana branch spur that we're working on? So there, as part of that project, they ended up picking two options. Uh, one is fully underground up Al Alameda TV station. The second is in East West, uh, but it only goes, it goes to 8th and um, Eighth and Flower, so it doesn't come all the way down to Pico like we wanted. So it's not exactly what we wanted, but um, it is going to go through the EIR, so we will get probably some good data out of that. Um, and we're basically trying to fight for the Pico route now through the Long Range Transportation Plan, kind of the original plan that we had, um, which will take longer than including in the West Santa Ana branch. But um, you know, it'll probably be a little bit longer, but we're still working on it. And I think. The process has sort of gotten the wider downtown community sort of engaged on this, uh, especially CCA, um, a little bit more than they were before, so. A lot more, I would say. I think that we were, it, it was a huge shot in the dark for us to go out and, and attempt to build support around something that had never been talked about even before, let alone included on a long-range transportation plan. And so for it to have gotten as far as it did and now to be where it is today, I think Um, and one thing I do want to add, as we're talking about transportation, I know um, all of us in this room have felt the um, impact of the MyFig project, which um, should be wrapping up by end of July. Um, but, you know, let's just, it, that's today. Um, we are going to be, we've been working very closely with DOT around how do we start, once the project is done, how do we kind of not let that be the end goal, but really um, push the usage of that project so that you know, the real win is people using bike lanes and using the new bus platforms on FIG. Um, so we are working very closely with DOT to make sure that that uh, goes as smoothly as possible. Um, we are also scheduling sort of a pre, a preview for South Park stakeholders 
Um, we'll do a walking tour. This will be before the big, you know, press event, the big launch. This will give <clears throat> all of all of us a chance to really engage with the folks, the project team, and DOT, and and uh, you know, give our feedback about what needed to happen and uh, uh, use it as sort of the lessons learned. What do we do the next time a public project like this comes around? Um, so stay tuned for that. That will, you know, depending on the timeline of um, like when the project actually gets completed, we will be scheduling that preview and of course the, the press event to follow. So stay tuned. Um, all right, thanks, Josh. Let's move on to district identity and marketing. Um, our chair, Terry, is in Barcelona. Um, so you can all feel jealous about that, but I'm going to kick it over to Wallace, our communications director, and she'll fill in. <coughs> all right. So a few things to update everyone on. The first is our utility box wayfinding project, which if you've come to the last few meetings of the full board or of the district identity committee, I know you know all about. Uh, we began fundraising for this project. The total cost is just around $22,000. Um, we had, we started I think a week and a half ago. Um, we've had three donors already come in at the platinum level, $2,000. Um, those donors are gonna get their logo on all of the boxes throughout the district, so it's a great marketing opportunity. Um, we've had an additional three who have said yes and are just working out their amount. And then a lot of interest from small businesses who are trying to figure out the best way for them to support um, at their ability. So we're really excited about that. Our goal is to have this installed to show off in time for NACTO in October. Uh, so to give us a little bit of leeway um, on the like uh, fabrication and installation side, we'd like to have the designs back by the middle of August, um, which means we need to get the designs going by probably the second week of July is a pretty quick design process. Um, we're using Rio's Clemente Hale. They're fabulous, they have a lot of experience in this field. Um, well, can you just in one sentence describe what the wayfinding is? Sorry. Uh, we are wrapping 22 utility boxes in South Park with maps and directionals. So um, we've done this with public art before. Um, instead of vinyl coverings that include you know, public art, these are going to be vinyl coverings with maps of the district and the surrounding areas, transit information, icons indicating businesses, um, and then larger icons indicating landmarks. So really excited about that, and we're hoping to get the design kicked off definitely before the district identity meeting on the 11th. I have, I have one on that um, yeah. with my fig. So I think some of the boxes <laughs> on my fig they were wrapped and aren't wrapped anymore. Are we going to rewrap? Whether yeah, it's signage or art? Yes, I believe most of the ones on 11 are ones that we've identified as part of the network. Yeah, almost none of the boxes that got city approval to be wrapped are still, um, except for ours, are still wrapped with the art that they got a notice to proceed on. So we've been working very closely with the council district on making sure we're set on that. Um, I have sponsorship decks if anyone would like to see one or has lost theirs. Um, <laughs> Let me know, I've got a bunch for you. Um, on to the next thing, unless anyone has questions on that. Cool. Um, parking day. So in 2005, this group of friends rolled out some turf in a parking spot in San Francisco and put some meters in the, like, literally just parking meter to see what happened. And they made a park for the day. And since then, it has become a global thing, the third Friday of every September, where all across the world, municipalities, um, people who want to see more green space in their communities, and businesses create their own little pop-up parks for the day. So we are building off of that and building off of our success with the Park Lot on Hope and building off of our hopes and dreams for the Pico Triangle to do a, uh, a large activation that weekend. And so um, we are working on closing that split lane like we did for GTLA Open House, doing a pop-up park there for the weekend, and then incorporating a block party as part of our Meet Your Neighbors program meet. So I know um, Meet Your Neighbors started two years ago. We've kind of diversified our events. We had a very successful coffee with the cop in May. We had a very successful bar call last night. And so um, we're really just uh, kind of adding another dimension and trying to use this event to build support for some of our longer range like streetscaping projects. Um, as part of this project, uh, Parking Day is coolest when it functions as part of a network. So um, we are hoping to get some locations in the district to do their own Parking Day activation. If you live in a residential building and you always think about uh, how great a parking spot across the street would be for a little pop-up park or a parklet, um, we can help you pull that off. We can't you know, project manage it for you, but 
Um, we are here to brainstorm, we're here to help you connect. Um, there's a gentleman that comes to a lot of our board meetings who did custom golf balls for an architecture firm in the historic core last year for parking day because they did putt putt in a parking spot. Um, it's a very fun event. I also have. Yeah, it's a cool idea. I have some parking day manuals for anyone who's interested in this. Um, I can also send it to you if you want to brainstorm. Let me know. Um, that is going to be. We're going to activate for the entire weekend. Parking day is the 14th. Um, we'll do the block party Saturday and we'll leave that activation up Sunday. Um, so mark your calendar. Yeah. All right, um, my turn. So, um, we, if you read your, your minutes or if you were at the May 24th meeting, you know that the board has voted to increase assessments next year by 5%. Um, also part of that meeting, uh, it was determined that we should really form a working group um, of board members to help strategize how the bid is going to um, move forward with all of this new development and work with developers to capture the value of development. Um, this will be, like I said, a working group sort of ad hoc. Um, I would love as much participation from board members as um, they are willing. Uh, I will be circulating a draft memo kind of going over what the purpose of this uh, meeting, of this group is, what our goals are, sort of with the process of um, uh, how we will work. Uh, after this meeting, so please just reach out to me and let me know if you're interested in um, joining that group. Jim Pugh will be sort of chairing that ad hoc committee, um, so if you, you know, we'll be working very closely together as we put this up, so stay tuned for that. Um, a quick update on the uh, office move. As you know, our lease is up at the end of the year, and we have spent a lot of time in the last six months um, looking for some new office space in South Park. We are in a funny little predicament where we feel like we've sort of priced ourselves out of the district. Um, but we have a couple of really promising options. One on Hope Street. I'm hoping to submit, or submit a letter, a letter um, by the end of the week. So tomorrow. Um, and we'll see what happens. We have a, a pretty good working relationship with the owner and uh, you know our, our, our lease length is just about, about the same time Fingers crossed that this works out. Hats off to Jade and I thank you for um, helping us put together some space plans. Okay. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, on that. Yes. What's the square footage range you guys are looking at? So anywhere between five and seven thousand is what we're looking for. Um, it's been it's been a, a, a I think a pretty um, illuminating exercise for me to be going into these spaces. Um, you know, I, I pretty much I know the district quite well, but it's a different story when you're looking yourself. Um, and you know, you realize, wow, there there is a bunch of property that's you know for lease, you know, in the southeast quadrant, let's say, of the district, but they're all 16,000 square feet. And so, you know, it's been it's been challenging, but um, again, very educational. So, I will let the board know. Um, Um, all right, so some policy updates. Uh, just an FYI, <clears throat> I'm sure everyone um, uh, who has listened to the radio or read a newspaper in the last month has heard about some of the challenges that Starbucks is facing. They, <clears throat> excuse me, have changed their policy to now allow um, non-paying customers uh, access to their facilities, their indoor and outdoor seating, their bathrooms. Um, we've been working closely. We have several Starbucks in the district. And we've been working closely with the managers of those stores to let them know that you know, we are here if they need us. Um, we have not seen any uptick in calls for service from the Starbucks, uh, but you know we're we're here to help. So just an FYI, that's what's going on, and our team is on it and ready to respond if necessary. Um, we are also involved in the um, sort of community engagement aspect of the Venn Central Jail. This is well outside of our district, but certainly a part of the downtown community. Um, and so there isn't really an update on that yet, but um, it's promising, I think, that they, the renovation of the facility is really through the lens of mental health, and I think it is a fantastic direction that the community is taking. So 
we are we are very much involved in those conversations with the county um, and and the city and the rest of the gay community in downtown. And I will keep you apprised as that sort of develops further. Um, we are still, I think, waiting for the council member to arrive. Joella, do you want to take, yeah, do you want to come in and just kind of take <coughs> us off? We should be here in about five, ten minutes. Um, Joella is the downtown area director for the council member. And um, yeah, do you want to just kind of give an overview and yeah, help the council member kick it off? Sure. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Joella. Um, I am the downtown director for uh, council member Jose Weegar. And uh, he had another event this morning, so he's coming a little late. Um, but I am happy to get started and really, um, I guess, answer any any immediate questions, or if you just want me to give a brief overview, what would you think? Brief overview, I think, of what sort of the, the priorities for the council member are. Okay. So um, obviously, homelessness is a top priority for us, um, and addressing uh, the numerous pieces of the puzzle to that to that uh, concern. Um, and as Ellen was mentioning. Um, the mental health issue, we're watching and seeing what's happening with the jail and um, the, the county space and, and what they're proposing there. Um, that piece of the puzzle, um, looking to do additional shelters, the storage, um, because in order to truly enforce uh, 5611 uh, law space that we need to be able to be able to, be able to provide those uh, options for our homeless before we can actually enforce some of those uh, ordinances. So we're really actively engaged in that process. Um, and that's everything from Lot 5 or El Pueblo. Um, I think we'll be announcing soon another uh, a venue here in downtown, which we're very excited about to uh, start that process uh, down in Skid Row area. Um, and uh, working obviously with LAPD to look at um, uh, a growing trend in our area is the, and if you guys are on social media, um, our uh, rise, our more blatant rise in public safety issues with transients um, or mentally ill uh, assaulting our residents um, on the streets. Um, so we actually just scheduled a meeting with um, Captain Reina um, and the council, council, the council member will be meeting with him Monday after uh, 4th of July because uh, everyone's hands are full right now with that. Um, and they're going to really be reviewing what are our city initiatives, what can we do to build a better capacity because our residents are growing. Um, we do have more patrons coming in from outside of downtown to our businesses and restaurants. Um, so how do we address those issues? What can we do? Is it is it time for us to call for additional uh, officers on the street? Um, where are we at? And let's analyze, especially as we continue to grow and look to the future. Um, so that meeting is scheduled for the night. So we're very excited about um, getting that up and running and having those discussions um, because it's just not okay with what uh, we shouldn't have to fear uh, or be constantly looking over our shoulder in downtown for someone coming down the street to arm bar you. Um, so we know that's completely unacceptable. Um, arm bar. Oh. Are you wrestling? Any wrestling fans here? Come on. <laughs> well, Dad and I watched WWE all my life growing up, so. <laughs> um, okay, so that was public safety. Um, down here, um, obviously street vending is a significant concern. Um, so we've been actively working, and as you all know, we're literally drafting the ordinance as we bring this together. Um, so um, Jesse on our team, who's our Director of External Affairs, is very engaged on the uh, overall city level. Um, we, uh, as you know, LA Live campus is in CD9, but the surrounding areas in CD14 uh, so we have submitted, um, right now, the law is proposing uh, two street vendors per block, unless there is a appeal made, and that appeal is based on public, public or health safety. So unfortunately, if I have a coffee brick and mortar, and a coffee cart comes out in front of me, I can't just say, I don't like it, and I peel it. There has to be, oh, this coffee vendor outside is using not a potable, not like not drinkable water. So it has to be a, a, a true concern. We can't dictate that. However, um, in very uh, areas similar to LA Live, uh, we can submit um, 
exemption areas. And we are looking at possibly three areas in the downtown area, um, LA Live and some of that surrounding area, um, because the intention is, yes, we've got LA Live, but across the street, I don't wanna have everyone that just went there and just have them across the street. Um, so we've kind of like spider webbed out from LA Live, so it dissipated also down to Pico. Um, then we also did uh, down in the fashion district and area down there because you can't even walk down the street on the weekends. You literally walk down the sidewalk. You have to get into the street to pass the street vendors, um, which is really bad. Um, and then also our historical monument um, on city property up at El Pueblo um, because our merchants in there are, uh, we value them and they pay taxes. And so that's the other exemption that we have in downtown. Um, so we're very actively engaged in that process. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the community? Yeah, about the, the July 14th? Yeah, uh, sure, sure. What is the spirit of the street vendor? You know, I mean, shouldn't it be to fill the gaps um, where there is no retail? So, uh, you know, I, those of you that don't know, I'm seven months into the position. So I was very interested in, like, where do we sit on this? How do we, you know, um, and, and it was related to me, you know, we don't want to, it was decriminalized because we don't want to say, hey, you're trying to make a living and you know you get busted for doing you know for selling you know watermelon on the street and you don't have your licenses and everything and you don't have your uh, you know maybe you don't have your paper so you know that starts a whole another process of we're not trying to deport you we're trying to get you legit and sell correctly mm -hmm. so we don't want to prohibit someone from making a living so okay how do you now regulate that um and so it was okay well if they're going to do this how do we maybe potentially regulate carts do they get foods? Uh, how do we make the prices affordable that they can go through the food handlers, uh, courses? Um, so it, we've literally been looking at every aspect of this is to find the best middle ground to help make it affordable that they are following the rules and paying taxes, but still available to do that. And then at the same time, um, help our brick and mortar businesses that have been there for a long time and give them an avenue to um, appeal if there is something that's not appropriate. Um, and then if you know that if, if it's truly two per block and you have three, flags are up. Like someone's not here that's supposed to be. Um, and so the next piece for this is the enforcement. Who's gonna enforce? Is it LAPD? Is it Bureau of Street Services? Um, how do they need to display their certification? So that's the next part I think that they're really looking at. Well, how long do you think this is gonna take? Because it's been going on for years. <coughs> Um, well, I touched base earlier because I was up at El Pueblo and, and having the same questions asked. Um, and they were looking at the end of the year to have and send to council the full ordinance for approval. Um, so if that happens at that point, I think it's just um, the when the order gets made and it gets approved through council, have, have the resources to start enforcing and, and engaging on that. And then they have health grade certifications? They're, they're supposed to have like all of the certifications the same as you would in a brick and mortar. And if they are cited for health grade or three other cards, what is the penalty or how will they be? I think that's where we're in discussion um, because if you, it's either a very steep penalty um, that you, that, that would be a deterrence from continuing or if you confiscate, then you literally are taking away their livelihood. So they're trying, they're on this fence of which one is the better option. Is it the first or second violation? I, so I'm not that deep in the trenches on that, but I know it's along those lines. They're looking to make it a severe penalty that you're not, uh, that you're fearful of getting busted. Did, did I misunderstand you when you talked about, I think you said exclusion zone? That there'll be an exclusion zone. What, what will be different from the exclusion zone and the non no street vending on the street versus two per block. So the exclusion zone is nothing. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. So one, the other way around. one of the concerns that, so the bid, the bid stance on this, just for, for the record, is that we supported the decriminalization of street vending, um, and we have very real concerns about um, because we have felt the impacts, especially with you know um, LA Live and Staples Center and Convention Center in our district. That is sort of a magnet for large groups course and um, a, a, a hot spot for, for vending. Um, I know ABG has had a whole host of issues on their campuses, which you know is private property and there's not supposed to be any vendors allowed on there. They do have their entertainment retail from LAPD that are that are constantly um, playing a little bit of a cat and mouse game with some vendors and it's read, led to some real safety concerns. Um, 
we're trying to get ahead of it before it uh, manifests in anything very dangerous. <laughs> but um, it's been a struggle, and we've been communicating with the, the council office about that. One of our concerns is that um, if we implement a no vending zone, it will encourage vendors to just move a little bit farther. And so we are, you know, really doing our best to say, okay, where where do you draw the line? The line is sort of arbitrary because wherever you draw it, it will encourage just more and more congregational vendors, um, which you know clogs up the sidewalks for pedestrian activity, um, creates safety hazards if, God forbid, we have to evacuate a building if there's an emergency. Um, and, uh, and and again, the, the carts themselves have proven to be um, not safe. So we are very much involved in this conversation and doing what we can to, to put some pressure on council to speed up this process because we have been waiting for years. And um, uh, with all this growth, it's just getting harder all the time. So. Can we see it at the hospital? Can yeah. Can we see it at Dr. Strong? Um, so another uh, few things, um, obviously we are engaged um, or have really engaged much more so than aggressively so into the Mike Vig uh, project um, and we all know that that's been a little bit of a mess. Uh, so <laughs> we're trying to really dive in and get some true timelines, um, some education surrounding what, what are they doing. Um, like as a new driver down the street, what is what does it look like? Um, we um, when I moved into City Hall seven months ago, uh, there's the street lights are different, and in Los Angeles and in the Temple area, and I just remember looking like, oh shit, what do I do here? Um, and so I didn't know. Um, so the question is, all of us that use Big and all these other locations, how do you manage? You know, what's the news? So we want to make sure we educate the public and our downtown folks that use the streets on a regular basis. What is the new visual? How do you turn? What do you check? Where do you park? Um, so we are engaged with them. Um, they, I feel like that they get something accomplished and they want to run with, with it. And I'm like, no, 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 you've got to stop. Let's educate before we just open something up. So that's a little new for them at the moment. Um, but we're very, we, we really want to take time um, now that we're finally getting close to the end, at least on the big side of, of getting that up and running, start releasing what that program is, what the street floor is going to look like um, and really do an education there because uh, we're on the same boat with the project we're doing on, on the other side down Spring and Maine. Um, so the education process there is something that we're starting to pay a lot of attention to um, and to the timeline of actually doing a ribbon cutting, if you will, of it. Um, 11 still has a, a, a second to go. Um, but so that's that's definitely on our radar. We uh, jumped in. Um, and uh, yeah, we're we're not going to do a ribbon cutting before 11 is over. Yeah. That's something that the bid has um, held a pretty strong position on. Um, so <laughs> I promise you that that won't happen. Yeah. 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 So you know, we like to celebrate little accomplishments at a time. I like that. <laughs> north side, north side, almost done. Let's start the yeah. south side. Yeah. Um, Good idea. So there's one more big thing I would love to tell you guys about, and hopefully the council member will be finally arriving. Um, the Civic Center Master Plan. Um, if you guys are on social media, we just released a video. I want to say in the last week-ish, um, and it kind of gives you an oversight of the whole Civic Center Master Plan. Um, when I came on board, they were talking about this plan. I was like, oh my God, this is massive. Um, we need to publicize it much more than we are. Um, so we started to, and then it just coincided um, in August, late August, we're supposed to start the demolition of Parker Center. Um, so here it is. Um, the Civic Center Master Plan, literally from City Hall East, Parker Center, LA Mall, um, the parking lots on the backside by Judge, uh, I think it's East Island, I think you pronounce it, um, Street. All of that goes away um, over the next 10, 12 years. And it turns into this very beautiful plaza that has housing, commercial, cultural, community rooms, business, um, 
I don't want to say it mirrors Grant Park, but it has some of that element to it. Um, the down here, here in South Park, we have our um, by the AT&T building or old old now USC building. Um, we have a huge building down there. Public, public so works. <laughs> we have this building that's way down here. So those of us in City Hall have to keep going back and forth. So we would be, and that's all leased out space. So we want to like move everyone from down there and move all of our city family together to create those efficiencies. Um, we would, um, back in the day, uh, we actually eminent domain part of Little Tokyo to build Parker Center um, during World War II. And it just wasn't right. So we want to rectify that and open it back up. Um, and so that's a huge um, uh, thing for us. I'm talking about Mass City Center Master Center. If you wanna, come on in. Come on, turn it over. Yep, turn it over. Certainly, the, the work you do with the bid without uh, the support um, uh, of the work you do. Um, as you know, uh, our city resources are stretched thin, and all the additional help you do, and the cleanups, and everything else really goes a long way. So, thank you so much. I'm not quite sure what Joella covered, but I'll just briefly uh, go over and say that uh, I think so the South uh, Park uh, area is one of the most exciting areas in downtown, probably having some of the fastest in, uh, growth. Not to mention that all of downtown has some of the fastest growth in the country, as you know. Uh, we've been told that we have the most uh, cranes in a large city uh, in the country right now going on here. But with that uh, growth, uh, it's incumbent upon us as a city, from a city council perspective and local government perspective, to accommodate that growth. Uh, and in my view, we are catching up to some of that growth instead of kind of seeing it and, and forecasting it and planning for it. So we're kind of catching up on the public amenity side. Uh, for myself, that means uh, making sure we improve our streets uh, and uh, create more uh, public spaces that are easily accessible by pedestrians and finding different uh, modes of transportation to get around the area. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much uh, Joel had covered on homelessness, but uh, all that to say that finally the city's doing a whole lot more on the homelessness front, as is the county, as we know with Measure HHH and H. But at the same time, uh, locally, uh, here in downtown Los Angeles, you know that we bear the brunt of a lot of the region's issues for homelessness. And it's historical because of the social service agencies here. So when people are brought here and perhaps don't get the services they need, they wander around the downtown. Uh, but that can't be more um, evident in the fact that, as you know, we have a broken mental health system. And about a third of our individuals who are homeless uh, have mental health issues. When our service providers here do not provide them with those services, they end up here in our neighborhoods. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the state needs to change the definition of gravely disabled. That is, um, how we define it. The state can come in and assist them and hold them longer and give them the medication they need to help them. Uh, and until we do that, we're going to continue to treat it as a law enforcement issue. Our officers go out, see someone acting erratically, they arrest them. Uh, there was a bill in the state legislature to change the definition of breaking this up disabled and hoping, uh, I'm not quite sure where that is right now, but we're, hoping we're supporting it as a city and as a county. Uh, but secondly, um, even if we change the definition, we don't have enough psychiatric beds. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, when our psychiatric hospitals were emptied uh, and no longer funded by the federal government. Um, so on those two fronts, I think we can do a lot for the more immediate issues of homelessness that don't get the services they need here. More locally, where we do have more direct control as to what happens, uh, I asked uh, in last in this year's budget for twenty million more dollars to house the two thousand unsheltered individuals in Skid Row. We have about two thousand that, that sleep there overnight. Uh, during the day, we have about four thousand people that are considered homeless in downtown. But at night time, there's about two thousand that are unsheltered. And uh, I received ten million dollars in what we call the PB account. That means it's unappropriated find a use for it, we can put it to work. And right now we are looking for sites, uh, publicly owned sites, to put up emergency shelters. 
uh, that will put people in those shelters, but not just put a roof over their head, but provide them services there and then get them into permanent support property in the long term. The good news is as well that the uh, governor just announced uh, a, lot of, a lot more money for homeless services throughout the state. Uh, we were receiving quite a bit here, um, and I've been told that some of the negotiations we're able to get $20 million for my initiative to help the shelter, to help the shelter here in Skid Row. We did a preliminary overview, and there are very few public properties in the area for emergency shelters. So we are now looking at privately owned properties to see if they're willing to do leases with us or the county to do emergency sheltering. And the reason we do that is this. I think if we are able to shelter people, then we are able to also enforce some laws that are on the books that we don't currently enforce. 5611, which means you cannot and subcommittee bills, uh, and, and others that will allow us to go out there and, in my view, beat out the criminals from those people who really need services because some people um, uh, like the conditions there because they're they need to beat off it, get some money out there, whatever it is, to do drugs. So we want to be able to go out there and if we provide shelter and give people services first, then we can enforce laws uh, that we have on the books about the captain's defense and all that other stuff. So in my view, it's a two-step process. The good news is that we're getting funding for it. The funding is there now. We just have to implement it. And I'm, it'll take a little time to find the properties and do it. That's the latest on homelessness. So all I started talking a little bit about uh, the Civic Center Master Plan. That's something that's kind of gone under the radar. But uh, when the city wanted to uh, demolish Parker Center, I asked them to do a master plan for the area. What we got, I think, in return was a great plan that will, number one, provide more efficiencies, but we're able to bring more employees from the upper region to one location that's built out more office space on the Parker Center site. But secondly, we're able to connect to downtown in the way that we have a new downtown because uh, downtown is becoming more active, more 24-7, and the Civic Center area will be able to do that. In the surrounding areas, we will rezone it to allow for more density, more height, and we already see that with some of the proposals by Omni, for example, that is purchased the other times building that has proposed some huge towers. Initially, I, I didn't like it, but then uh, as I thought about it, uh, I thought that it would help us accomplish our third goal for the new Civic Center Master Plan, which is to um, make that itself 24-7. Uh, because most civic centers, as you know right now, in the evening time, it's dead, no one's there, employees go to their homes, but now we will have more activity around the civic center with more density height for people living there for uh, 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 retail, et cetera. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we're doing the first phase, which is to demolish Parker Center and start building the office for the employees. So that's pretty exciting. But I'm here as well to listen to you and see if you have any questions or comments. So I'm open for any questions or comments you have. Thank you, Councilmember. Yes. I have one. Um, thanks for your leadership in downtown. It's been great. It's a booming area, especially here in South Park. One of the things we've been talking about with the LAPD and Captain Reyna is these hot spots um, where either transit comes on the Metro Blue Line across from Staples where there's target rich environments um, because of the density of people that are there now. Yeah. And then with AEG presenting this morning, we're gonna have an expanding convention center. We've got all these other residential and hotel developments popping up, gonna be delivered early 2020s. Um, and so what we've been trying to do, and, and Joella mentioned kind of coordination with LAPD on this clash between increasing residential populations and homelessness or just pure criminals, um, we would like to stay closely involved with the council office and any of this LAPD coordination that you're doing and maybe dovetail with what we're doing with them to help identify the spots in our district that could be some extra help. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as downtown continues to grow, we need a new uh, policing approach. Old model of LAPD, mostly in your car through the street to get community policing, put a couple of speed, uh, speed beats, etc. But with the density we're creating here, we're asking LAPD to change their model of how they do cases. Density, uh, whether it be for bicycle cops or uh, cops on horses, whatever it is, and, and how they identify and prevent crime. I think the approach needs to be a little bit different for downtown. And quite frankly, I mean, all of us were catching up to the, the new activity downtown where, for example, in the past where I was um, promoting more sidewalk dining, initially I would closed because they didn't want more activity and some hot spots where they thought they would create more crime and we've seen cop catchers understanding that more eyes are needed in the street, more light in the street.
street means that's pretty much to me. And so uh, it's little things like that that we've been in discussions over the years that we're beginning to kind of uh, LAPD and the city is beginning to understand that we need different units and approaches downtown, but particularly here for South Park that needs to be looked at that. I have a couple of meetings coming up with Captain Reina uh, on that. Um, and also uh, Chief Moore, I spoke to him and he was just uh, this morning, yesterday, or even this morning. <laughs> Uh, I, he's open-minded, and I, I, tell, I talked to him briefly yesterday about the importance of uh, visiting with us here in downtown to see what's here, but really walk the streets with us, talk to the kids, and, and understand it's evolved in downtown and beginning to approach this differently, and not just look at the stats they look at and appropriate their resources accordingly because those stats are a little bit different for what is a majority suburban city when we have some very different activities. And last but not least, I think uh, here around uh, South Park, one of the great, uh, another accomplishment that we have had is we will reach our 8,000 goal or more hotel fees, um, which is great. Uh, and the uh, expansion of the convention center has sputtered in the past, but it seems like it's been a new life, which is very good. We're about to know in terms of the budget search of in the state of California what we need. And, and uh, so that's going to start. But I'm pretty excited about what this area will look like.
picking three or four different things to do um, as a downtown community from planting trees to helping paint curbs to and then engaging all of our city uh, families uh, at the same time sanitation um, the various departments uh, office beautification and we're all literally going to be able to focus on downtown to do a day of cleanup and community engagement uh, on uh, September 22nd so that's part two to this event so we're very excited about that and we'll we'll be disseminating information about that as as the details work themselves mm -hmm. out. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all. Thank um, you. We'll call the meeting to a close. Yeah, sure.